for people unfamiliar with you, um, please just tell us your name, a little bit about your background, and really what you've been doing for the last several years. Okay, well, I, uh, my name is Brenda Davis. I'm a registered dietitian, and I became a registered dietitian in 1983. So I have been doing this a long time. I became vegetarian, pretty much vegan, by 1990. And, uh, and it was an interesting little journey because I was a, actually a public health nutritionist in Northern Ontario. I'd, I'd met one real live vegetarian in my whole life and that was it. And uh, I remember making the decision and my husband asking my husband if he would be willing to become vegetarian with me. We had been married about 10 years at that point. Well, at that, yeah, 1990. We were married in 78. So anyway, he, he looked at me and he said, I thought you'd never ask. Oh, I would love to be a vegetarian. So I count myself very, very fortunate in that regard because he grew up in Northern Ontario where it's, it's hunting fishing territory. So um, anyway, my journey was I became vegetarian, moved out west to the west coast, and in 92 wrote my first book with my writing colleague, Vasanto Molina and Victoria Harrison. And within probably six or eight months, it was a national bestseller. Uh, and, uh, and then we, you know, we, we just, my writing partner, Vasanto, and I continued writing. And so I've done, uh, I would say, 10 now, 10 sort of vegetarian classics, if you will. And I'm working on my 11th, which is a diabetes book. And, uh, and so have been very actively involved in the plant-based world for about 30 years. And the books, Becoming Vegetarian and Becoming Vegan, and now we've got the big Becoming Vegan, and, and I've done diabetes books and so on. And, and the other thing that I've done that I think is, is kind of interesting is in 1990, no, 2006 it was, I was asked to um, be a part of a, uh, a research project in the Marshall Islands where they have the highest rates of diabetes on the planet. And, uh, and so I became involved in that work and I've still, I'm still involved in that work. And, uh, and it, it's been quite an experience. So lifestyle medicine has really come into the picture for me. In fact, last year, I, along with uh, Dr. John Kelly, who was the founding president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, we actually did an intervention in Lithuania as a demonstration for the medical school and the government uh, what you can do in 10 days using a, a pretty carefully designed plant-based diet. And, and then we had a press conference afterwards, and so that's a direction that we're moving in is to, you know, these sort of demonstrations to allow physicians to see how powerful this form of medicine can actually be. Are you familiar with any of these studies? And if so, can you tell us what they concluded? Uh, number one, the more recent meta-analysis of all the best studies that showed a 31% increase in mortality for people who ate a ketogenic diet. Uh, number two, Gary Frazier's Adventist health studies. Number three, regard studies showing the African-American diet is deadly. And number four, Walter Willett Nurse's health study and the health professional follow-up study. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> um, the first one regarding ketogenic diet, I, I actually um, I don't believe it was a ketogenic, it was a low carbohydrate diet that they were looking at. We don't actually have really long-term studies of people on ketogenic diets, but definitely we have them on people doing low carbohydrate diets. And consistently, there, there, is, there are no exceptions that I'm aware of in all of the meta-analyses. The 2018 study in particular was, was quite interesting, uh, but they all show um, uh, increased mortality of at least 30%, some even higher. We've got some that show increased mortality of 51%, so, but, but in the lowest carbohydrate eaters. But what you have to understand is there are really three places you get macronutrients. Carbohydrates, fat, and protein. When you lower carbohydrates, it means you're increasing fat and protein. Where do people who are doing low carb tend to get their fat and protein? 
often from animal products because animal products are free of carbohydrates, with the exception of dairy products, which contain some lactose, which is a, a carbohydrate, of course. So a lot of meat, um, and, and we know that meat is linked to increased risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and so forth. So it's not any you know, surprise, in my view, that we're seeing increased death rates in people eating low-carb diets because they're eating a lot of meat. And, and I think that the other thing for people to realize is that you know, ketogenic diets uh, in particular do work to accelerate weight, weight loss. People lose weight on these diets. But what we have to understand is that weight loss, it, you can achieve weight loss doing anything that produces a caloric deficit. In this case, you're not providing enough glucose for the body, so it has to resort to an alternative fuel. Um, you, you can lose weight smoking cigarettes. You can lose weight going on chemotherapy. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. And, and I think that's, that's the key. With a ketogenic diet, you're eating mostly fat. You're eating 75 to 80 percent of calories from fat, generally. You're eating about 5 percent, at most, carbohydrates. Well, plant foods provide between about 60 and 90 percent of calories from carbohydrate. Even non-starchy vegetables average about 58 percent. The only exception is nuts and seeds at about 12 percent. We are trying to get down to 5 percent. So what you're reducing is the most protective foods on the planet, plant foods. The foods with the most fiber, phytochemicals, antioxidants, plant sterols and stanols, and all of these protective, the prebiotics that feed healthy gut microbiome. So in time, you're gonna pay the price for doing that. We need to maximize protective components, not minimize them. And, and so that's, that's you know the whole bit about the low carb diets. Uh, with the Adventist Health Study 2, uh, there are actually, you know, I want to bring in a couple of other studies here because there are actually three studies that have followed populations uh, who are sort of similar health conscious individuals over a period of time to see who develops what disease. The biggest is the Adventist Health Study 2, with about 96,000 participants, started in 2002 and is, has been ongoing ever since. And in this particular population, what we see is, um, so we're comparing m meat eaters with semi-vegetarians, with fish eaters, with lacto-ovo vegetarians, and then vegans. So you've got all of these different groups of people eating different diets, but living similar lifestyles. So they smoke the same amount, they exercise the same amount, they drink the same amount of alcohol. You know, we're controlling for all of these variables. So it's a very fair comparison in the end. So in this case, in the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study, what we see is that, is that the, the more you remove animal products, the better people seem to do in terms of uh, a variety of, of of endpoints, and so hard endpoints. So we're looking at um, di diabetes rates are uh, about, uh, I believe it's 38% uh, lower for lacto-ovo vegetarians than the meat eating, the similar health conscious meat eaters, and about 62% lower for the vegans. And uh, so diabetes, we see lower rates of heart disease, not so much in the women in the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study, but huge differences in the men with the vegans having by far the lowest rates of heart disease, about 42% lower than the uh, meat eaters. Uh, we see lower rates of cancer in the Adventist Health Study too. It was about 16% lower for vegans and about 8% lower for the lacto-ovo vegetarians. And specific cancers were even more uh, pronounced. Uh, uh, kidney disease was about, I think it was 52% lower in the, um, the vegetarians and vegans combined. Uh, in now Epic Oxford, a very similar kind of study following about 65,000 individuals since 1993. Uh, they saw a reduced risk of cataracts, you know, 40% less in the vegans, 30% less in lacto-ovo vegetarians. They saw lower rates of, of um, uh, 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 what is it, um, 
oh shoot, I'm, I'm blanking right now, um, a gastrointestinal um, polyps or these kinds of things. Uh, and it was 27% uh, lower in lacto-ovo vegetarians, 72% lower in uh, the, the vegans. So a very profound difference. And, and then um, in, in the Taiwanese study, which was uh, over 6,000 people, they, they've had similar reports. They're comparing there the Buddhist vegetarians versus the, and this is the Suchi uh, group, uh, the Suchi health study. And, and again, lower rates of diabetes in the vegetarians compared to the similar non-vegetarians, about 51% for the men and about uh, uh, 74 to 75% in the women. And they just had a brand new study, 2018, that just came out showing about a 21% lower rate of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the, in the vegetarian. And the vegetarians in that uh, community are almost vegan. There might be a little bit of egg that sneaks in there, a tiny bit of dairy, but very, very minimal. So we've seen, I think these studies are really um, among the best studies we have long term, looking at the consequences of eating, uh, you know, living relatively healthfully and eating slightly different dietary patterns from, you know, the extreme of the meat eaters to the vegans. And uh, so it's interesting. And the other things that these studies have looked at, uh, particularly the Adventist Health, Health Study in Epic Oxford, is nutritional uh, status of the individuals. And, and in the Adventist Health Study, the results have been very positive in that regard. Even calcium and B12, are, they're in good shape. Uh, whereas in Epic Oxford, the calcium and B12, they weren't as in good shape. Uh, there are fewer fortified foods, you know, see the non-dairy milks and so on that would provide those nutrients. They're not fortified as much. So we saw more B12 deficiency and more fracture uh, rates, higher fracture rates in the vegans in that study. But with the fracture rates, what was really interesting was that um, the, the, the people that were consuming under 525 milligrams of calcium a day, they had about a 30% increased risk of fractures. But the people who were consuming more than that didn't have any difference in fracture rates compared to the meat eaters. So I think that the lesson in that one was really that we still need to be conscious about including good sources of calcium. And we, you know, most of our nutrition education for the public teaches you that dairy products are your source of calcium. And so we need to take it upon ourselves to learn about good dietary sources of calcium in the plant-based world. And then the other studies, the third study, um, what was that one again? The, because that one I wasn't as familiar with. Uh, the REGARD study? The REGARD study. I, I'm probably familiar with it, but not familiar with the name. Um, yeah, REGARD study showing the African American diet is deadly. Oh, yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we've got dozens of studies showing the African, or the, you know, the African American diet is, is deadly. It's very similar to what we call uh, the Western diet, but in some ways it can be even worse <laughs> because we're looking at often even more sodium and even more fat because there are a lot of deep fried foods and just a lot of fried foods, period. And so it's hugely concerning um, because it, it, certainly genetically, uh, there's an increased risk for higher blood pressure, and that increases your risk for all the cardiovascular diseases and peripheral artery disease and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's a huge concern, and I'm you know, heartened to see so many people in the African-American community who are uh, really getting on to uh, understanding this and, and being advocates for a really healthy, whole food, plant-based diet. So I, I, I can see changes will come, but it, it, it really is a, a greater challenge there, I think, in some, some respects. And then the fourth study that you mentioned was? The Walter Willett Nurses Health Study. Oh, well, the Nurses Health Study has been a study that, you know, people have been followed. There are two studies there, really. There's the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study and the Nurses Health Study. And these studies have been combined in you know, meta-analyses and so forth to provide the results of following groups of 
of uh, individuals, nurses and physicians, mostly for about 30 years. In most cases, 27 to 32 years. And looking at, again, the health outcomes. And again, we've got some powerful evidence that meat increases risk of, of heart disease and diabetes and other, other diseases. And we've got a lot of evidence for you know, uh, higher fiber, higher fruits and vegetables, reducing risk of disease. Very consistent in these studies. And there are literally dozens of these studies that are out. And, and one of the things people can always do, if you have an interest in a specific area, is to go to PubMed. All you need to do, it's free. You just type in whatever you're looking for, heart disease, nurse's health study. Uh, just simple words, press the go button, and, and the studies start popping up. And you can actually read at least the abstracts. The studies aren't always free, uh, but they are. Some of them are free, but the abstracts are always free, and you can get an idea of what the findings were. So it can be really, really interesting to do that. The media often reports that alcohol in moderation is part of a healthy diet. What do you think about alcohol's impact on our health? Oh, it's so interesting. It's such a story, really. Um, you know, w the reason that alcohol is sometimes said to be advantageous is, I think, mostly the heart disease story because uh, alcohol would increase HDL a little bit. And, and there are also some phytochemicals in certain, you know, red wine, for example, is fairly high in resveratrol, which is a, a powerful antioxidant compound, which may be protective. But I think what people need to understand is, number one, uh, we're now recognizing that not, HD, not all HDL is protective. Uh, and, and so the whole HDL, all of the drugs we use to try to increase HDL uh, have not, I mean, really have not saved lives in the end. Uh, and so that whole piece is, has come into question. Uh, and then the other thing that I, I think people need to understand is alcohol is um, a, a potent uh, toxin to the liver. It can destroy your gut microbiome, which affects every body system we know of. And it is, there is no level of intake above which uh, you will not increase your risk of cancer. So it is a potent carcinogen. Uh, in my view, the optimal intake of alcohol is zero. Uh, however, that having been said, even uh, the cancer organizations who clearly state it is a potent carcinogen, no safe level of intake, they still suggest not more than one serving a day for women, not more than two for men. And I, you know, in my view, that's too much. Uh, it's one thing if you're having a small glass of wine occasionally at a special event. It's another if you're drinking every day. And I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to your gut microbiome. I think it's dangerous for your liver. I think it's dangerous uh, for your risk of cancer, especially in women breast cancer, uh, but all, all, a variety of cancers it increases risk for. So uh, I think we need to be very, very cautious where alcohol is concerned. I use alcohol for cooking. Um, uh, sometimes um, a little bit of white wine in a sauce, for example, but the alcohol gets cooked away. <laughs> so, uh, and it's just a flavoring, it's a small amount. Other than that, um, I, you know, I, I have to tell you this story because I think it's kind of interesting. I, the first time I ever got inebriated, I was 11 years old. I was at um, the home of some Europeans. I was with my parents, and they served us like everybody else, drinks before dinner, during dinner, and after dinner. And I remember uh, thinking it felt pretty cool. <laughs> and I started drinking with my friends on the weekends. We'd sneak a little bit of this and that from our parents. And, and I, I started getting, by the time I was 14, um, not liking the person I became when I drank on the weekends. And I can remember, and I, I can't remember if I was 15 or 16, but it was right in that neighborhood. I think I was 16. 
I remember one day I walked down to the water. I was sitting by the water's edge on a big rock. It was probably about six o'clock in the morning. I've always been a morning person. And I remember thinking about my, my association with alcohol. And I started thinking about all of my uncles who were alcoholics. I started thinking about my best friend's father who was an alcoholic. I started thinking about the people, the innocent people who had been killed by alcoholic drivers, about all of the people that destroyed their livers with alcohol. I didn't know a lot about it at that time. And I thought to myself, let's really think about this here. What is your life all about? And I remember thinking, I don't know yet, but what I do know is I want to live a meaningful life and I want to survive and I want to make a difference in the world. And I thought to myself, the last thing I need to do is become addicted to anything. And that day I swore off anything I could become addicted to. And that was the last time I really drank any amount of alcohol. Once in a while I'll do a toast and have a sip, but I, I really don't do alcohol. And, I, and I, I've never had a cup of coffee. I just, I just decided I, that there's something that I don't like about being addicted to things. <laughs> And so that was it for me. And, uh, and I, I think we need to think about that. Uh, addictions, alcohol is an addictive substance as well. And uh, we just, we need to be thoughtful and conscious when we're, when we're really trying to live a meaningful life, especially, which I think most of us are. Some people say beans and grains didn't exist until 10,000 years ago and therefore are not really our natural foods and our bodies aren't programmed to eat them. And therefore, we're actually meant to eat animal products. What does the best science have to say about this? <laughs> I love that question. It's a great question. Um, I guess science has two things to say about that. Number one is it's not true that we didn't eat beans and grains back then. As a matter of fact, we probably have at least a dozen studies showing that, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, even middle Paleolithic period, people were consuming uh, grains and beans. As a matter of fact, I, I believe it was Mount Carmel, Israel. There, there are very specific locations where they show the predominant foods at certain seasons were actually beans or grains. Uh, so they were used in, in, uh, in, in those times, in Paleolithic times. Uh, and the second thing that I would say is just because something wasn't consumed in Paleolithic times doesn't mean it's not healthful or uh, uh, an important food for humans today. People lived about two to four decades in Paleolithic times. And I think obviously the, you know, the wild diet, whatever people were, were eating back then was probably reasonable for human health, like the diet of other animals that eat in the wild, we eat what we're me meant to eat to some extent. But I think the mistake that people are making is assuming that humans just lived on animals. First of all, during the first 20 or first 80 percent of the Paleolithic period, humans were vegetarians. Uh, they didn't have the skills to consume to kill and consume animals. So they might have gotten a little bit of dead meat from something that had died, or you know, <laughs> or or some insects. Uh, that was about it for the first 80 percent of the Paleolithic period. If you look at nutritional anthropology research, the work by Melvin Connor and Boyd Eaton is very very interesting. Uh, during the the, the the last 20% is when they gained skills to add uh, uh, hunting and started eating, consuming animals. But even with that, the estimated intake of um, fiber was about 70 to 150 grams a day. That's more than what vegans consume. Where does fiber come from? It comes from plants, period. Just plants. So they were eating a lot of plants. Secondly, vitamin C was around five to 600 milligrams. Uh, the estimates for potassium were in the 1997, they were estimated at over, over 10,000 milligrams. And then uh, in, the, in the 2010 study at about uh, seven, I think 6,700 or 7,000, no, it was about 7,000 milligrams, I believe. That, that's way higher than vegans uh, consume. And, and where, where does potassium come from? Well, mostly fruits and vegetables. 
Uh, and, and so, you know, really and truly this idea that they were just chowing down on these big chunks of animals is, is a myth. Um, certainly there were some hunter-gatherers, especially in the northern parts of the world, that, you know, probably only consumed 35 or 40 percent of calories from carbohydrates and were consuming more meat. But even those people were consuming about 500 milligrams of vitamin C and 70 grams of fiber. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is a large amount of plant food, plant matter. Uh, people closer to the equator were probably consuming closer to 65 percent of calories from carbohydrates, which means the vast majority of their calories came from plants and probably closer to 150 to 200 uh, grams of fiber. Uh, so there's no question that I think that the, the idea of what Paleolithic people actually consumed is not quite accurate. And of course, even if it was, the animals today are not the same as the animals, you know, the wild animals they were catching. Today our domesticated animals are about, you know, 30 to 40 percent of calories from fat in their meat, whereas it was closer to 10 percent, and it is closer to 10 percent in wild animals. Uh, very big differences. Even the levels of persistent organic pollutants that are, you know, all of the um, all of the chemicals that, you know, the hormones that are added, the antibiotics that are added into our, you know, domesticated animals today, this is not the same as, as the animals people were eating in Paleolithic times. And, and even the wild plants were very different. They were more concentrated in fiber. They were lower in sugar. They were more concentrated in trace uh, nutrients. And so, uh, it's it's not you know you're not eating the same thing if you think you're eating the same thing you're not eating the same thing as people did in Paleolithic times and it makes sense that if you want to get to that to the levels of vitamin C and potassium and fiber that people were eating in Paleolithic times you need to up your produce intake big time and and your consumption of whole grains is not a bad idea because that's one of the more and beans is the most concentrated source of fiber it helps us to get to those numbers so you need to really look at how we're evaluating the paleolithic diet are hemp flax and olive oils good for us to eat should we try to include these oils in our diet or should we try to avoid them oh this is a good question too so so hemp um, uh, olive and flax oils. Um, I think these oils are wonderful, but they're the best when they come from the whole foods. <laughs> because when they come from the whole foods, these oils come packaged with fiber and phytochemicals and plant sterols and stanols and all of these beneficial components. So to me, extracting oils from foods, pouring them onto our foods, is not as healthful as using the whole foods. For example, I make hemp seed dressing all the time for my salad. I use hemp seeds. So I get not just the omega-3s and the wonderful fats that are there in the hemp seeds. I get the protein. I get the fiber. I get the trace minerals. You don't get that from the oils. And so that's, you know, and it depends. There are some people that can afford those extra calories. But what we have to remember is that those extra calories uh, are 120 calories a tablespoon. And they don't have any, uh, you know, they don't have the same kind of satiety value as when they come with the fiber. So my, you know, if you're an athlete and you're burning 5,000 calories a day, you're getting a ton of nutrients, you might be able to afford a little bit of that. You're a diabetic who's overweight, who, who's trying to uh, reverse insulin resistance. You don't have room for highly processed foods. Oils are fairly highly processed foods, uh, just like white flour is. It, to, to me, oils are to the sort of fat world as sugars and refined carbohydrates are to the carbohydrate world. We want as much as possible to be getting our, our fat and our carbohydrate and our protein from whole foods. And so I'd, I'd say eat your flax seeds, eat your hemp seeds, eat your olives uh, uh, with some caution with the olives because they can be very, very salty. But uh, it, it's, it's just you're getting so much more value for your calorie. Uh, when you think about nutrient density, the foods that have the lowest nutrient density of all are, well, pure sugar is at the bottom of the barrel and close behind is, is pure oil. 
because there just is not a lot of nutritional value left. Now, I believe that the oil, if it's a fresh pressed, high quality oil, I think there's more redeeming value to that oil than there is to the sugar. Uh, because the sugar, there's nothing there. With the oil, you actually help to enhance the absorption of fat soluble phytochemicals and vitamins like vitamin D and vitamin E and so forth and carotenoids and such. Uh, and there's a little bit of vitamin E there and when it's fresh pressed, you may get some uh, phytochemicals uh, remaining in, in olive oil, for example, and in flaxseed oil. And so there are some components that provide some advantage. So if I were to have to choose a little bit of one or the other, I don't think either is poison. I think, I think in small quantities as part of a whole food uh, diet, in, in very tiny amounts as a flavor, they could have some you know, use, but I wouldn't use them as a food. I'd use them as a flavor in the tiniest amount possible. And for myself, I use very, very, either very, very rarely. I have sugar in my house, I use it to feed hummingbirds. Uh, otherwise, I use fruits for my sweeteners. I use either whole fruits or dried fruits. And I dry my own, you know, pears in the summer, in the fall, really. It's, it's usually about fall when they come around. And I use dates and, and because we get fiber and vitamins and minerals and it makes more sense to use those as our sweeteners in, in our treats. Author Chris Kresser, who believes in paleo diets, says that according to studies, Eating dietary cholesterol does not lead to higher rates of blood cholesterol in most cases. And even if eating saturated fat and dietary cholesterol does lead to higher saturated fat rates or blood cholesterol, it still doesn't correlate to higher death rates. Do you agree with this? Why or why not? You know, I'm going to start out with saying I have tremendous respect for Chris Kresser. I think he is one of the sanest voices in the paleo world. I think he has, uh, he's, he's very astute and he looks at research very carefully. So I, I really do, um, I, I, I do have a lot of respect for him. However, I think he's wrong on that one. And, uh, I, and I think he's wrong for, for this reason. We have uh, many decades of solid research that shows saturated fat increases blood cholesterol levels and particularly LDL cholesterol, which increases your risk of heart disease. The studies are strong and consistent. In our, you know, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology's guideline reports, they, they suggest um, saturated fat be limited to five to 6%. And the, the level of evidence is the highest grade of evidence that exists. Uh, and, and it, I mean, I think it's really quite indisputable. Now, the study that most people are quoting to suggest that uh, we don't have to worry about saturated fat is the Chowdhury trial that came out in 2014. And the Chowdhury trial was so riddled with errors and omissions that Walter Willett, who's probably the most quoted nutrition expert on the planet, uh, made a very strong statement that uh, people need to discard the, um, uh, you know, the findings, essentially. And, and just to give you some examples of the issues uh, in that study, um, I, I, think, I think there were really two, two big, you know, big, well, one big issue is in many cases, uh, the studies that were included in the meta-analysis uh, were controlled for cholesterol. <laughs> so you can't control, when you're looking at saturated fat, you can't control for the thing that saturated fat increases, which increases risk of, uh, you know, um, or the, you can't control for a variable that's on that chain of, of what causes the disease. It doesn't make sense. And so that, that was one thing. And then the other thing, I think that is really important to mention is 19 out of the 20 studies uh, were looking at pop, sort of comparing within population. So comparing, say in the United States, people eating you know 11% saturated fat versus those eating 12 or 13 or 14. 
then they were looking at the Japanese, some of whom were eating 5% 5 5 saturated fat, some eating 6 or 7%. They didn't see big differences because the amount of saturated fat was so, uh, the differences in the consumption were so small. There was one study included that actually looked at huge differences in saturated fat intake within the population they were studying. That was Epic Oxford. The, the, of course, the meat eaters were eating much more, the vegans eating much less. The vegans who were eating the lowest amounts, which I think were around five or six percent, uh, about half the saturated fat of the meat eaters, actually had 2.77 times less uh, uh, you know, uh, lower rates of disease than the highest saturated fat eaters. Then the other thing that's really interesting is if you compared the population that had the highest intake of saturated fat, which were the, um, the uh, I believe the people from Finland, they actually had a 4.4 times higher rate of heart disease than the people eating the lowest in Japan. But they didn't do those cross-cultural comparisons at all. And, and so, you know, the other thing that I think is interesting uh, about that study is, is that when the study was first done, they actually did show an increased risk with higher saturated fat intakes, and this study was rejected uh, originally from the first publication they, you know, they, they went to. And then they actually reworked the data a little bit and, and got something different before it was actually published. And so I think there, there, there are some things that people need to understand that sometimes the headlines uh, you know, and the headlines were huge after that study came out. Butter is back, saturated fat vindicated. You know, all of these headlines came, and people came away thinking, wow, saturated fat's been vindicated. And in fact, that study vindicated nothing. As a matter of fact, I actually uh, spoke via email with one of the uh, co-authors of that study who said to me very clearly in an email, this study does not show saturated fat has been vindicated. <laughs> she said nothing that, that has been said for, for several decades about saturated fat has changed because of this study. Saturated fat increases LDL, increased LDL increases risk of heart disease, period. And, and so I think that's, that's very important to know. And then the other thing to know is the American Heart Association put together a panel of the leading experts on diet and heart disease, uh, and and it was I, I actually spoke to one of the lead authors of of this report. It was the most comprehensive report I've seen. It was called the Presidential Report, 2017, and they went through all of the research, and they were very very clear about a saturated fat. And I'll tell you what the message is. The message is this: if you replace saturated fat with refined carbohydrates, you will not reduce your risk of coronary heart disease. It's a, it's a wash. They're both bad. And so that was the new information that we got from these studies. However, if you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, you reduce your risk about 25%. If you replace saturated fat with monounsaturated fat, you reduce your risk about 15%. If you replace saturated fat with whole grains, you re reduce your risk about 9%. And to be honest, in my opinion, that would be much higher if the whole grains they were choosing were truly whole grains as they're picked off the plant, not flour turned into whole wheat bread. Um, I think we would see very different results. So I think we need to be, you know, we really need to be cautious about this, you know, put butter in your coffee and, uh, you know, cook with all sorts of oil and pour it on your foods. Uh, th this is not a good plan and it will, it will backfire. Uh, so people need to be very careful about this. How does someone protect their thyroid? So, um, so the question about um, what we can do to make sure that we protect our thyroid, uh, a few things. Uh, number one, I would say, is that we need to make sure we have a source of iodine in the diet. And you know, the vehicle that, that has been used to, to provide the population with iodine is iodized salt. And when people become more concerned about health, they get concerned about using iodized salt because of some of the components that are added to the salt to keep it flowing. Sometimes things like aluminum can be added. And so they're eliminating often iodized salt. 
And, uh, and so they need to make sure they have an alternative source of iodine if they're not using iodized salt. And you can buy some iodized salt, like iodized sea salt and other iodized salt that don't use uh, the, the, the harmful uh, f uh, agents that allow the salt to be free flowing. Um, but if you're not using that, and, and we want to limit our salt intake, so I can understand people uh, not wanting to use that. We can use seaweed, but again, seaweed is actually really concentrated in iodine, especially certain types of seaweed like kelp. And so you have to be a little bit knowledgeable about how much to use. So for example, the dried kelp powder that you can buy as a sort of a sprinkling for your food, uh, we're looking at between probably a tenth and a sixteenth of a teaspoon. It's not a lot. The upper limit for iodine is 1,100 micrograms. The recommended intake is about 150. It's a little higher during pregnancy and lactation, but for most people, it's a, for most adults, it's 150. And so uh, uh, it's just a small amount that's needed. If you are, you know, averse to using uh, seaweed of any sort, then uh, probably uh, iodine drops or uh, multi with I iodine would be a reasonable option. There is some iodine in our food, depending on the soil content and so on, but it, it can be a little bit of a, a risky thing if you're, not, if you're not getting some sort of more concentrated iodine source. And in Europe, it's actually even worse because uh, the, the soil content tends to be lower than it is in North America. So that's number one. Number two is I think it's really important to um, protect your your body's ability to produce hormones. And so we don't want to be over consuming refined foods. We don't want to be over consuming sugars. We don't want to be getting too much visceral fat, uh, which can compromise uh, our whole system of hormone production. We want to be exercising regularly. We want to be eating a lot of healthy foods. And some people worry about what we call goitrogenic foods because a lot of healthy foods are go have goitrogens in them. And so things like um, soy and flax and, and all kinds of cruciferous vegetables, which are our primary provider of, of you know, things like um, isothiocyanates that induce phase two enzyme systems to help us get rid of harmful compounds that float around in our bodies. And so these are powerful foods. They contain goitrogens, but goitrogens, I just wanna say this, goitrogens are not a concern if you have enough iodine in your diet. Uh, so we can have a variety of these foods and not worry about them. It's when we're iodine deficient or we're not eating enough iodine that goitrogens can just compound the problem. So I think that, you know, basically we, we need enough of the, the key, um, you know, a number of key nutrients which are important for hormone production. But those nutrients generally we get enough of when we eat a variety of whole plant foods. And I think it's a, a valuable thing to include enough nuts and seeds as well because they tend to be really good sources of some of the trace minerals that we don't get in as great a quantity in other plant foods. In Dr. Stephen Gundry's best-selling book, The Plant Paradox, he says lectins are microscopic proteins that plants evolved to defend themselves from predators, including insects and animals, that includes humans. Uh, they are essentially indigestible and have the unique ability to increase the permeability of your intestines. That means that they can pass through the wall of your gut and will and be treated as foreign invaders by your immune system. This causes an inflammatory response, which can set the stage for a host of diseases, as well as weight gain. Um, what foods are rich in lectins? Generally speaking, all grains and legumes have more lectins than anything else. In some cases, pressure cooking can destroy the lectins. Nightshade vegetables, squashes, and select nuts and seeds are also rich in lectins. Do you agree with Dr. Gundry? Why or why not? I, I would say I, I agree with the first part of what he said, that lectins are um, co compounds in plants that help to protect the plants and, and those basic bits of information about lectins, but I, I don't agree that they are the issue that he's making them out to be. Uh, and, and in fact, if they were the issue he's making them out to be, 
I don't think plants would be the foundation of the diets of all of the longest lived people in the world. And the one food that is consistently consumed in every blue zone, you know, there are two things about diet that are, that are said that are the sort of the golden threads of diet that we can weave through every single blue zone. One is they eat a plant-based diet and two is that they eat legumes. If legumes were so toxic, uh, they wouldn't be the foundational, one of the foundational foods for every single blue zone on the planet. Uh, so I think that is really important to recognize. The second thing to recognize is all lectins are not created equal. So there are many lectins, some of which have been actually found to be highly protective to health. They've, there have been studies done, particularly, particularly out of Japan, showing that they're highly anti-carcinogenic. And they, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing studies to look at using them to treat cancer even. So there, there are a variety of lectins. They're not all the same. And in the legume family, for example, the lectins in small legumes like lentils and even in peas are, are not as toxic as those in, say, red kidney beans, which are the hemagglutinins in red kidney beans are, are actually very toxic. And, but you almost never see toxic reactions from them. Why? Because lectins are destroyed by soaking, sprouting, cooking, and it takes about 30 minutes of, you know, boiling or cooking at a reasonable temperature to pretty much destroy all the lectins. And so that's why I think they haven't been found to be an issue. You don't destroy necessarily 100%, but you destroy the vast majority of them. And I can remember one study that came out showing kidney beans, you know, having this horrible reaction in people. Well, it was a study of people in a hospital that had been fed undercooked kidney beans. You get a kind of, um, uh, your symptoms are like food poisoning. Uh, a horrible stomach upset, vomiting, diarrhea, the whole nine yards. You're sicker than a dog for about five hours, and then you're okay, but it's not a good thing. You don't want to go through it. Cook your kidney beans. So uh, one thing that does concern me is I do see people sometimes selling sprouted kidney beans and sprouted black beans and sprouted large beans as part of a mix, and that is not, you are not gonna get rid of enough lectins just by sprouting. You get rid of, you know, a percentage of them, but they're not as completely uh, taken away, and, and I think that that's very risky. So I would definitely, for the larger beans, larger beans need to be cooked, period. There are so many paleo, keto, Atkins, low-carb authors in books. Why are so many people who are well-educated, credentialed, and smart concluding that the low-carb diet, not the whole food plant-based diet, is best for human health. What are the most compelling, important, and convincing studies that make you believe that a whole food plant-based diet is the proper diet for humans and that a diet that includes animal products is not? Well, this, uh, you know, it's true. Uh, it, it, these diets have become wildly popular. They've become wildly popular because they work for weight loss. Uh, they induce fairly rapid weight loss. So when you put your body into a state of ketosis especially, uh, and so here we're talking about the ketogenic diet, uh, you, you burn fat and, and it works for that. Uh, and, and with a paleo diet, you have to remember with a paleo diet, you're eliminating refined carbohydrates, you're removing dairy products, you're removing grains, you're removing beans, but you're removing a lot of processed foods. What are you eating? You're eating meat and you're eating a lot of vegetables and fruits. Uh, this is uh, better than the Western diet. That's a lot of fried foods, a lot of fast foods, a lot of soda pop. There's no soda pop on a, on a paleo diet. So yes, we'll see some improvements. Uh, and yes, we see some you know, short-term improvements in uh, a keto diet. And, and so what I would say about these diets is that they're, they're short, I think, especially a keto diet, um, but even a paleo diet is they're a little bit short-sighted. I think a really uh, well-planned paleo diet 
if it really is paleo and it's getting 100 you know, grams of fiber, 70 to 100 grams of fiber and 500 milligrams of vitamin C, if it really is akin to a paleo diet, it's a diet full of plants. As a matter of fact, I did an analysis where I, I, I actually, I actually um, I, I did an analysis using a, some software of three days of recommended paleo menus and then three days worth of recommended vegan menus. And the vegan diet actually came way closer to the nutrition profile of a paleo diet than the, what people call paleo today. As a matter of fact, the only nutrients that they get closer to a true paleo diet on are cholesterol, because we don't have any cholesterol on a vegan diet. Uh, they were closer in protein because the diet contains about 30% of calories from protein. Uh, they were a bit closer in zinc and, and vitamin A. Uh, otherwise, all 13 other nutrients were closer on a vegan diet, which I thought was quite interesting. So, so basically, I think what, what people need to understand is what we're calling paleo isn't as close to a paleo diet as what they sometimes assume it is. And, and to get to more closer to the paleo numbers, they need to be thinking about more plant foods, more fiber, more vitamin C, more potassium added to the diet. And what we know about the connection, is the, the concern I have is the 30% of calories from these domesticated animals uh, is a huge mistake because we know we have, you know, uh, so many studies, there was a study and nurses, health professionals and health professionals follow-up study that actually quantified um, the, the increased risk. If you replace just 3% of your calories from uh, animal products with plant protein, so animal protein with plant protein, you reduce your risk of death by, I think it was 32% if the replacement was from processed meat. Uh, it was, I think, 19% from eggs. It was like 12% from meat. It was about 9% from, from uh, poultry and about 6% from, from fish or, or uh, no, maybe it was 6% from poultry or fish. Anyway, it was in those numbers, but you replace 3% of calories from animal protein with plant protein and you reduce risk of death, no matter what kind of animal protein you're replacing. And then there was another study out of Canada from 2014 where they found in people 50 to 65 years of age, if you ate more than 20% of calories from protein, you increase your risk of mortality, it was I think 74%. You increase your risk of diabetes and, and, and uh, cancer by about 400%. It was incredible. And now we didn't see quite the same numbers with people over 65, but, but what they did find, what they did find was the, we only saw the increase when it was animal protein. Uh, when it was plant protein, uh, it was, the, the, the results were no longer valid. Plant protein didn't increase risk. It was just animal protein. We have multiple studies showing high animal protein increases risk of disease diabetes, heart disease, cancers. And, and, and so diets that focus on that, so paleo diet is very high in meat because they're trying to reach that 30% protein. Now a keto diet, it's fat. I mean, you're talking 75 to 80% of calories from fat. So it is literally uh, some meat, which doesn't contain any carbohydrate and a bunch of oil poured on the meat uh, or coconut oil, or, I mean, they do include a little bit of avocados, a little bit of, uh, of nuts and seeds, but nuts and seeds are 12% of calories from carbohydrate. They only allow five. So you can only put so many of those in. And then the other food they allow is, uh, is non-starchy vegetables. Now, non-starchy vegetables, well, leafy greens have only about a gram of carbohydrate per, per cup. They are allowed about 20 grams of carbohydrate. So you could have a good amount of greens, but other non-starchy vegetables, contain between six and 12 grams per cup of carbohydrate. So it's not like you're eating cups of vegetables. Uh, you know, a cup of Brussels sprouts is 11 grams of carbohydrate. You're not eating a ton of that stuff when you're eating a keto diet. You're eating mostly fat and meat. This is not a good plan because what we need to remember is we need to remember that the components that are most protective to human health that we've seen time and time again to be most protective to human health are fiber, phytochemicals, antioxidants, 
um, pre and probiotics, uh, you know, all of the trace minerals and vitamins that are needed for health, protein coming from plant foods, uh, uh, carbohydrates coming from whole plant foods. And when people eat that way, like the people of the Blue Zones, like the people in the Adventist Health Study too, and, 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 and in you know, Epic Oxford, when people are eating more plant foods, we actually see better uh, health long term. Uh, comparing in the Taiwanese Health Study, again, we see better results long term on the people eating more plants. Because plants contain most of the compounds that are associated with better health and longevity, better brain function, better gut microbiota. All of those things are improved on a plant-based diet. What do you see as the importance of the real truth about health conference? The Real Truth About Health Conference is the one conference, I speak at many, many conferences, it's the one conference that provides all of the information that comes in during the conference free to the world. Uh, and that is quite a gift in my view. I, I don't know of any other conference that does that, provides the YouTube videos of all of the talks so people can go to at their leisure whenever they want and access them and watch them five times if they want to at absolutely no cost. Uh, and I'll tell you, this takes an incredible amount of work, an incredible amount of, I mean, they have sponsors and so forth, but to be able to give you this information free of charge for a, a long period of time is uh, just incredible to me and I'm very, very grateful that they're doing that. Uh, there are many people who would never have access to this kind of information uh, otherwise. So thank you, Truth About Health Conference. <laughs> it's great. Hi, I'm Brenda Davis, and I'm doing a little bit of a different kind of interview this time. I'm actually just going to show you a little bit of the fitness of a 60-year-old vegan woman. I've been vegan for about 30 years. And several times when I've been in lectures, I've been challenged to do something physically. One time I was challenged to do push-ups, but the last time I was actually challenged to when I said I still feel like I'm 30 years, you know, still physically feel much like I did when I was 30, um, to prove it. <laughs> so I'm here to prove it. So I'm gonna start with doing a little bit of the flexibility and balance piece. And flexibility-wise, I've always been relatively flexible, so I'll just show you that. <laughs> and that feels really good, by the way. <laughs> and, um, I can do that. So I'll, I have to t tell you, I, my push-up skills have reduced slightly because I tore my rotator cuff and I'm still building back up, so I'm not sure how many I can do, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Give it a go, <laughs> anyway.
stop at 50. <laughs> so now I'm going to just do a little jump rope for you. It's one of the things that I, I actually, to be honest, don't do it that often. I should do it more often, but it's one of those tools you can bring with you anywhere. And you can get a workout in 15 minutes of, of good jump rope. And, uh, and so I'm just going to give you a little demonstration. Because normally what I do, my routine is 500 of these and then 500 double unders. <laughs> so, but not 500, uh, every 10th one is a double under. So the whole point of this is really one of the things that people often say about vegans is they lose muscle. They're not as strong, they're not as fast. And in my experience, it's not true. I don't think I, I've lost much muscle since I was 30. <laughs> I'm just as strong, I'm just as fast, and I'm more flexible than I probably, I, I, I'm at least as flexible as I was when I was 30. So, um, vegan can support uh, excellent health. Being vegan can support excellent health and can support optimal fitness at every stage of the life cycle.